Welcome back and welcome to section 3, Project Jigsaw. In this section we'll discuss one of the major new features of Java 9, Project Jigsaw. Project Jigsaw is one of the most substantial changes to the Java programming language in recent years and in this section we'll discuss the goals of the project as well as the impact it will have on our previous examples. We will conclude the product with an example of how to modularize a larger and more complicated Java application. Welcome to video 1, Introduction to Project Jigsaw. In this video we're going to take a look at Project Jigsaw, what it is and what it's trying to achieve. So what is Project Jigsaw? Well this is sort of the meat and potatoes of this course. So it's probably the biggest new thing for Java 9. Unlike lots of other languages, Java has never had the concept of modules or any kind of module system come to that. So Project Jigsaw is an umbrella project with new features aimed at the introduction of a module system to the Java language and its implementation in JDK source and the Java runtime. JDK source being the Java development kit that we downloaded at the very start of this course. The goal of this is to make it easier for developers to construct and maintain libraries and large applications hopefully improving the security and maintainability of the Java platform at the same time. So, well, what is modularity? Modularity is a design principle that helps us to achieve, amongst other things, loosely coupled components, which is something that's really important in large scale systems. It helps us to define very clear contracts and dependencies between these components, and we've seen a little bit about how important that is with class design. It helps us to create hidden implementations by using strong encapsulation, and we've seen how handy that can be with our nested class examples. Previously, a jar would have been considered the unit of modularity, with the jar being the output of the compile phase of a Java application. The problem with this though is that it provides no mechanism and no scope for defining explicit contracts and dependencies between interdependent jars. Jars, once they're built, just become these standalone executable things. And the real problem with jars is that actually when you launch one, it launches with a bunch of implicit dependencies expecting other jars and other compiled classes to exist on the class path. And the fact is, more often than not, this doesn't happen. And Maven helps us to solve some of these problems, but Maven doesn't give us a really strong modularity contract between jars. And then we end up with this thing that's commonly referred to as jar hell. Sounds a bit extreme, but imagine having multiple versions of the same jar all sitting on the same Java class path. When your jar launches, the class loader tries to load the first jar it finds leading to unexpected and unpredictable results at runtime. The other issue with the Java Virtual Machine using a class path was that the compilation of the application would be successful. When you build your jars, they build in isolation and the IDE will only check the jars are on the class path that are needed to be there. The problem is, if we have different versions of the same jar on the class path, the application will fail at runtime because the class loader gets executed at runtime and we end up with a class not found exception as a result of missing a missing version of the class at runtime. So the class loader might load an old version of the class which doesn't have the same interface as the new version of the class that you depend on. So what is Project Jigsaw? Well Project Jigsaw is trying to give us a new unit of modularity and it's brand new for Java 9. The construct of modules and a whole new modular system for the Java programming language. The goal of Project Jigsaw is to create a module system for the Java language that solves some of the problems that we just illustrated when talking about Jar Hell. Now, this is actually a huge project. Although the interface that it gives us is fairly small, what the Java development team have done is actually apply it to the entire Java development kit source code which, as you can imagine, is enormous. So Oracle have modularized the entire Java development kit and all of its libraries and all of its dependencies, which is an absolutely enormous task. They've also updated the runtime to support modularity. So the runtime can detect 
if there are module conflicts before it gets executed. Now, this also has a side bonus. When the Java language was built, there were a bunch of internal APIs that were never meant to be accessible. And as we've seen, there's not really any way to create a private class. And the result of this has been that library developers and programmers have started to leverage internal APIs that were never meant to be accessible. What Jigsaw's done is enabled the Java development team to hide these away and encapsulate them in a module that doesn't expose that interface. So what is a modular architecture? Well, the module system implemented in the language supports modules as a top-level construct, just like Java supports packages as a top-level construct. Developers can then organize their code into modules and declare the dependencies between them in a module definition file, just like a manifest file that we have for Maven. Now, this requires something called a module underscore info Java file. And what these do is define, as a bare minimum, the module's name, the packages it makes available publicly, and the modules it depends on. So much like we've seen with a POM file, which defines a set of dependencies for an entire project, what we're doing is actually essentially defining the dependencies for a single module, this new unit of organization that didn't previously exist. We're capturing this in a module info manifest file and packaging it up with the code. So that defines the name of the package it makes available publicly and what it depends on. So you can think of it almost a little bit like POM files, but for packages. So imagine we had a project structure a little bit like this. This image on the left here shows two modules, a reader and a writer class. So we have the reader at the top here and a writer at the bottom. And these are Java 9 projects, and we can see that because they have these module info files defined in them. And these module info files define what those packages depend on and what they export themselves. And the code for each of these is placed underneath the reader and writer directory. So let's think about some common module definition file terms. Well, firstly, we have a module. And the module definition file starts with this keyword, followed by the module's name, and then the rest of the definition file. We also have the requires keyword, and this is used purely to indicate the modules that that file depends on. Next, we have exports, and this is used to indicate the packages within the module available publicly. So any functionality that the module is exposing to the rest of the world needs to be defined in the exports line. And lastly, we have opens, which indicates packages that are only accessible at runtime, so not those that are statically available at compile time. So let's look at a sample definition. And we have two module info files here. Firstly, we have com.jamescross.io.wheels. And what this is saying is it's going to expose the wheels package to the rest of the world. So wheels um, contains some functionality that's being exported to the rest of the world that other modules can depend on. Next, we have another module, com.jamescross.io.car. Now, unsurprisingly, a car needs wheels. So we're saying we require what's in that wheels package. Now, if we were to remove this exports line from here, this would fail at compile time. It would say wheels is not available. And this is not something we could do before Java 9. We would just assume that this was available, even if it wasn't. And then it would fail when the car tried to use, it, use its wheels. And lastly, we're exporting the car module as well to the rest of the world. So we can see here how we very clearly define the dependencies between modules in a very, very simple manifest file. But the thing is, it's going to save us at runtime. This will now fail at compile time if there's a problem. The build will fail rather than you deploying your application to production, thinking it's good to go, and it failing a week down the road when somebody calls a function and the class path is messed up. So that's everything for this video. All we've done is a brief introduction to Project Jigsaw.